when you recorded the album initially, all those years ago, did you take notes so that, or is this all just in your memory? You know how to. No, it's basically in my memory because, and, and you know, a lot of the sounds now on a lot of the plug-in software things that go go with the the, uh, the computerized mixing systems now are based on some of the most of the sounds we we used to do on on those records. You know. But when you hear it back, uh, say for example, in a rehearsal setting yes. live, you're able to determine by listening to it what. Uh, as you ter as you termed it, perhaps the volume is not quite right on a particular uh, instrument, yeah, or, the, or there's a t there's or a sound that's not quite right. That's right, or the equalization is not quite right, and needs a bit yeah. more treble, more but less bass, so forth. And it's just a question of blend blending the, the the sounds in. So there was really no production notes taken, I guess, at the time that you were recording. No. Amazing. Well, well, yeah. I mean, I I, I had sort of n notes, but they don't really refer. They would be they wouldn't refer to anything I'd want to do, you know, on 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 the live performance. On a live performance. No. All right, so when you're editing at the studio, yes, and I know from those days, at least in America, on the American side of the pond, we would use uh, razor blades. That's and we right. We would cut it on a, on, a, on, a, on a block, yeah, either straight or diagonal. That's right. But you didn't. You used scissors. That's right. Well, the EMI's approach to that, uh, we, went, as soon as we started as a, as a junior at the studio, is we were given these little brass scissors, uh, and we, get, we were given a piece of gash tape, and we had to practice our angle. And the, and the only reason I can... I've never fathomed out was the fact, you know, EMI was really sort of like doing a lot of classical music, which was very, very quiet. And if you used a razor blade, it'd be slightly, it would be magnetic or could be. And so it could affect the tape. put a little thump the on the tape. tape. So brass scissors are anti-magnetic. So that's why they, they're, they're science people, if for want of a better word, wanted us to use brass scissors. So when you left EMI, did you take the brass scissors with yeah, you? Yeah, I've still got them. In fact, they're the brass scissors that I did that magic edit that all the, the Beatle fans know about on Strawberry Fields, which was a big sort of long edit that I snipped away at. That's not gonna, that brass scissor is not going to show up on eBay, is it? No, no, no. Good. No I think it needs to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame oh, or sure. Smithsonian Museum. Yeah, everyone knows about those scissors. When you, um, we, you should point out you're a four-time Grammy winner, right. which is pretty impressive. Yeah, so uh, in addition to Sgt. Pepper, uh, what were the other three Emmys for? Uh, Grammys. What did I just say, Emmys? Yes. Let me rephrase that, Your Honor. <laughs> I, I, it's been a long day. In addition to your Grammy Award for, for Sergeant Pepper, uh, what were the other three yeah, Grammys? So we had Sergeant had? Pepper, and then we had uh, Abbey Road, Band on the Run. And with, that was when Paul was with Wings. Wings, right? yes. And actually, Band, Band on the Run, I think, is, is, is a Paul McCartney album rather than a Wings album, but to be technically correct. Okay, um, I can do that. No, I think it is. Um, um, and uh, I, I got a, a, a technical Grammy about four years ago for breaking down barriers and building new frontiers. Pretty impressive. Yeah. So do you have all the Grammys sitting on one spot? And uh, do you think of converting them to microphones so you can record no, with no, those no, Grammys? No, I, I, no I, I have them, obviously. But they're, no. No, they're great. Because they are, you know. Now, obviously, the recording industry has changed over the decades. And you've seen it. So when you started out, were you dealing with two-track machines at that point? Uh, we were dealing with basically two track machines and uh, if, if the band at the time was a, 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 good, a hit band or artist, they would let them use four track. And when I first started in 1962, the same month that the Beatles walked into the studio when they would cut Love Me Do, um, uh, they were on just two track. Two track. Yeah. Amazing. And the first album was two track. Amazing. Yeah. And now, of course, with... Uh software and all of that you can have unlimited tracks yeah right so i mean and pepper of course was only four track although we did four track to four track on some of the songs right but it's still basically a four four the master you know multi-track is right. a four track tape how long did the the process take uh, uh f in terms of recording sergeant pepper was it a, a week-long project or no it, it was over a few months and we never worked weekends and i actually logged up the hours and it was 700 hours a lot. Spaced over, for, for those days it was, yeah. Yeah. Now, my wife would kill me if I didn't ask you this question, but how many times did you cross that crosswalk uh, between Abbey Road and the other side of the street? Uh, Abbey Road Studios on the other side right, of the street. I, I, well, I guess it's it, 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 a quick thing from, from my mind. I, I guess two, two times every day for nine years. I'll do the math later. I can't okay. figure it out right, right now. Right. <laughs> but that's pretty impressive. Yeah. That's amazing. And that area, we should point out, a lot of people don't realize this. Everybody, I think, thinks it was always called Abbey Road Studios. Right. But in fact, it was EMI. That's right. And only became uh, uh, Abbey Road Studios once Abbey Road, uh, as an album, became so popular. That's right. Yes. And it was probably a good marketing decision to rename yes. the studio. Yes. Gave it immediate uh, prominence and uh, cachet yeah. and yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's pretty impressive. We should mention also, 
that you are the author of a book along with Howard Massey, which right. is called it's called Here, There, and Everywhere, My Life Recording, The Music of the Beatles That's right. by Gotham. Yeah. Yes. And it's available in paperback as well as hardcover. It is now, yes. But I would imagine hardcore fans would want, would want the hardcover. No, sure, sure, absolutely. To say the least. So, and this recounts w with very few pictures in it, which is, I think was a good idea because you really want to create a time and place without having it challenged by photos that may not work. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you know, do, doing the book. I mean, it's my life from basically the year you know from seven years old when I fell in love with music. I mean, it's a long story, and and uh, but but basically, I, I, most people have sort of who are vivid, avid fans, you know, know um, you know what Studio Two EMI looks like where we did most of the work. Uh, but doing the book, I thought, well, m in, because it's it's a nice story and it's in depth, and it, it, for the reader to actually conjure up their own in their own minds what it was like, it's very descriptive, you know. So so rather than put a picture in the middle, it might destroy their image of, of what what they conjured up. So I thought, looking, uh, just, you know, at one time we thought, oh, we n we would need pictures, but I, I think it's a good idea not to have pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fans generally would view what you do as. Uh, magical, perhaps mystical, given yeah. the nature of the work and the association with the Beatles and right. what was produced. From the inside out, looking in from your perspective, was it was it primarily just work? In other words, you're in an environment, you're creating, but it's still, you don't have a sense that 20, 30, 40 years later, it's still having an impact on people. Uh, well, I know, I mean, but in the time of, of making it, I mean, we, we didn't know that, but, um, my, my, what the way I used to work, because I'm really not that technical. I, I mean, I used to, but I, what, we were actually like, re, you know, mixing engineers, as we were then, then sort of called. Um, and I was, you know, interpreting what I was hearing into p pictures in my mind, different colors and the way different tones were represented in either blues, greens, you know, browns, gold, silvers, and so on. So it's basically constructing, you know, the, this, this picture, and I've sort of gone off a bit of a tangent here to, to answer right. your question. So that's the way I sort of env envisaged the, the thing as I was sort of constructing the mix, the sound mix in, of, in, in my mind as a, as, a, as a picture, you know. And you've created, would you say, of all the, the work you've done with both the Beatles and others because you've right. worked with Elvis Costello, I yes. mean, you've worked with all, all yeah. kinds of, of people. Right. Um, would you say that the, of all of those collaborations and all those albums that you've worked on, would Sgt. Pepper be the... The, the big one for you in your uh, mind? Yeah, that and Revolver. And I Revolver. Mean, and um, the White Album you were involved the in. The White that, Album. Yeah. Well, some of it, well, there's, there's another story involved with the White Album, I mean, which you can get from the book. But some, but an Abbey Road, of course, you know. Uh, you know, Imperial Bedroom and Elvis and so right. forth, you know. So you had a great career. And all the America albums, the band America we made, the George Martin and I made those. Yeah. And all these years you still have that accent? No, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> Even though uh, you're an American citizen. Yes, yes. Excellent. Yes, which is great, yeah. Well, Jeff, thanks for being on the show. No, thank you. I appreciate it. It's Jeff thanks. Emmerich, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, he's going to be in charge of the audio for Sgt. Pepper Live featuring Cheap Trick at the Las Vegas Hilton. And the dates again are September 13th through the 15th, 17th through the 19th, and 21st through the 23rd. This is Lunchtime with Ira, and we'll see you next time. You've been watching Lunchtime with Ira, live from the Las Vegas Hilton.